Before we start today's episode, I'd like to thank everyone who donated to our Kickstarter, who made this project possible, and to everyone who listened to our introductory episode and has been waiting patiently for more. I'm happy to say the wait is finally over. I'd also like to personally extend a thank you to Sean Guillory from Sean's Russia blog for his invaluable podcasting advice and comradely guidance on how to turn our idea into a reality. And without further ado, My name is Brian Gigantino, and welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. In Georgia today, historical knowledge about the Soviet past comes from a variety of places and is transmitted to the broader public in a number of ways. Personal experiences are shared and passed down by those who lived in the Soviet Union. Public holidays observe and emphasize particular moments of Georgia's Soviet story, while, of course, overlooking others. Museums, exhibitions, and monuments are torn down so others, telling new interpretations of the past, can be built. Art, literature, music, and films creatively share histories about Georgia's Soviet story. Memes, applications, and discourse on the internet are also playing an ever-growing and concerning role, but more often as a conduit for ideas already in circulation than their source. But politics and universities are different beasts entirely. In Georgia, politicians constantly instrumentalize opportunistically history about the USSR for a variety of ends. This reinforces popular ideas about the Soviet past and imbues these understandings with particular politics. When Georgia's opposition holds signs that say things like, never back to the USSR, or a governing politician refers to an opposition politician as a Bolshevik, the Soviet past is publicly reduced to a narrow pejorative, a stand-in for aggression or authoritarianism. Sometimes, these narratives are catalyzed by events, like the 2008 Russo-Georgian War or the protests in the summer of 2019. Each event remobilized the USSR as a prominent political analogy in popular discourse. Politicians seize these opportunities to advance agendas and, of course, careers. Universities in Georgia, on the other hand, should be centers of free, open and rigorous research on history, where students can, and professors can pose critical questions, challenge entrenched narratives, and clarify to the public what the past really means. But in Georgia, they face major hurdles in doing so. And why exactly is that? Well, one major reason are NGOs. Georgia's NGO sector funded almost entirely by grants from Western governments and international organizations, has since the late 1990s grown into a crucial and consistent sector of Georgia's always struggling economy, propping up not only a fledgling middle class, but one with incomes tethered to particular worldviews and ideas about economic development and politics. Georgia's 2003 Rose Revolution structurally endowed this middle class NGO intelligentsia with a set of ideas about the USSR and its end in 1991. The idea was that Georgia's natural path towards westernization and Europeanization depend upon a rejection of the Soviet past and anything relating to socialism. Therefore, anti-Soviet memory politics became central to congealing Georgia's new post-Soviet national idea and trajectory of political and economic development. Even Georgia's years of independence between 1918 and 1921, before Sovietization, when the country was ruled by Menshevik Social Democrats, has been hollowed of its socialist content in contemporary popular discourse and framed solely in terms of national independence and geopolitics. <laughs> 
As a result of furthering dependence on the USA and EU over the past 30 years, Georgia's historical self-understanding has mirrored formal interpretations of the USSR by the USA and the European Union. For example, the collapse of the USSR, and by extension Georgia's independence from the Soviet Union, was under the post-Rose Revolution administration of Mikhail Saakashvili, constantly publicly attributed to the United States and more specifically the presidential guidance of Ronald Reagan and their Cold War struggle against Soviet communism. In 2008, the EU's Prague Declaration, in which Nazism and Soviet communism were formally equivocated as morally indistinguishable totalitarian systems, was essentially copied into Georgian law through the Liberty Act which, among other things, banned symbols of both Soviet communism and Nazism. This in practice meant Georgia's two Western patrons, which the Georgian economy and statehood now fully depend, would systematically underwrite the reproduction of anti-Soviet memory politics in the country, both directly and indirectly, through NGO-funded research projects, narratives of democratization, and policy development. In the end, both politicians and academics in Georgia are not only faced with narrow career choices, but are subject to a political economy of historical knowledge production in which the demonization of the Soviet past is an integral centerpiece of the Georgian economy and reproducing the national idea. On this week's episode, to discuss these issues and more, we are very happy to have Professor Timothy Blautvelt as our guest. Professor Blautvelt teaches history at Ilya State University in Tbilisi, Georgia. Teaching in Georgia for almost 19 years, he has produced a range of scholarship on patronage networks in Abkhazia, the 1956 protests in Tbilisi against destalinization, attitudes in contemporary Georgia towards the Russian language, and has an upcoming book entitled Clientelism and Nationality in an Early Soviet Fiefdom, The Trials of Nexter Lakoba. Tim, welcome to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. Tell us a little bit about how you started teaching. On my first visit here in 1999-2000, um, I wasn't here to teach at all. I was here to do my own research, to study Georgia, and to continue my studying. And I was one of those, since I had taken the summer program, I was one of the very the few people who, who had actually studied Georgian before coming here. Um, but that Time uh, was the late Shevardnadze period. It was uh, a period when um, the electricity was off most of the time, uh, when you would have whole days, even weeks, um, without electricity, without water. You'd have the trifecta of no gas, no electricity, no water. Um, and I was also not researching history at this time. It was much more of a current events sort of thing. And to the extent that it was history, it was recent history. So as you're starting to teach Soviet history, in the mid 2000s in Georgia, how do the students understand the Soviet past? What are their conceptions of it? How do they imagine it? There was kind of a divide, and some of the students were were really young, and a few of them were were a bit older uh, at that time, maybe in their thirties. Uh, and the older students had a much larger fixation on the Soviet past from movies and a much more sympathetic view of it. I remember specifically. Uh, students from Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and that's the things that they would challenge me on would be things from more Soviet mythology, uh, like things about World War II, you know, the heroism of, of the Red Army or, you know, the defense of the of the fortune at Brest, you know, they were so brave and they sacrificed so much. And, you know, um, the younger students uh, at that time, um, if if they were, if there were things that I said that they disagreed with, it tended to be more conspiratorial things that they had read about. Have you seen the perspectives and understandings of your students change over the years? They still know very little about, about the period. They still have never heard of the 20th Party Congress, generally speaking. And often those who have heard, um, have heard, again, these kind of conspiracy theories that they come across. Maybe they've read an article about how NATO was planning to destroy the Soviet Union or vice versa, you know, these sort of things. Um, they, I think, have less background in those Soviet cultural references, like films, like World War II films and things like that, that than they did years ago. They also, uh, I have noticed, um, again, this question of Russian. Um, and like I said before, some of it may be sort of aspirational or sort of purposeful forgetting, but uh, it is, I think, more common for students 
you know, to honestly say that they can't read a source in, in Russian or an academic source in Russian. Um, it's always been the case, I think, that you do have um, or the ideological orientations of specific students. And this is not unique to Georgia. This happens in teaching in the United States and other places too, where you know they come with an ideological fixation. I think one, um, one thing that stands out in Georgia and in, in comparison with having taught in the U.S. and experience in, in university in, in the U.S. is that um, it's, it's actually very rare, I think, uh, first of all, it's very rare for writing, and this is this is a bigger problem in, in in Georgian universities. That it often happens that I get students at the MA level who have never really written a serious term paper in Georgian before, and it's it, I think it's a more general problem that it's academic writing is something that's often not required at the undergraduate level, and so you know all of the techniques. How do you make an argument, um, and also debating for the purpose of debating is also something that isn't very much emphasized and that people don't have very much experience about. So one of the things that I like to do in my, in my Soviet history class, for example, is a debate is to engage the students through having a debate about certain issues. And one of the ones that I like to have a debate about is um, the, the so-called development question in the 1920s, the scissors crisis. Um, where do we go from now? Uh, you know, where, where, how, what strategy of, uh, of further development to be take. And so, you know, there was this argument between the left and the right in the 1920s in the Soviet Union. Do we, um, do we continue economic relations of NEP and gradually move towards uh, economic development? Or do we crack down on the farmers and on the NEP men and extract the resources and make use of the state in order to have development happen? It's actually a really interesting question that then underlines modern development economics for the next century. <laughs> you know, the role of the state versus the role of the market. But in Georgia today, is there a shared understanding of the Soviet past between the public and academia, or do they greatly diverge? So the view of history, I think, that is generally shared um, is one that emphasizes or that looks at this period through the prism either of heroic resistance, how much we fought back, and also of, of suffering, and excluding everything that doesn't fit into that, that those, those two views. So either how much we suffered or how much we resisted the regime. Uh, and the topics that they pick are also ones through which um, that work well in that prism. So focusing on things like the... Um, the, the the Democratic Republic of 1918 to 1921, or the the uprising in 1924, uh, or the the demonstrations um, in 1956 or in 1978 so, about language. Certainly, you can find elements of both suffering and of resistance in the history of Soviet Georgia. It's not to say that those things don't exist, but of course, many things exist in addition to those as well, and, and are simply not focused on. Um, I mean, there are particular myths that come up in the popular interpretation of history, and I don't see, for the most part, um, academic historians challenging. And I think that that's one. It, Georgia is not alone in this. In Eastern Europe, in the former Soviet bloc, that history is oriented around a very nineteenth-century conception of the the need to define nation and to glorify the nation. In Western Europe and the United States, history and historians and the, the academic fields in general have moved away, I think, from the, their existence to justify and to define nation to being something much different. And one of those differences is to challenge the assumptions in society, to challenge the mythology in society. And the sort of the idea that academia, and, and this is why the right in Western Europe and the United States perceives academia as dangerous, right? Rather challenging these assumptions, um, being making nuisances of themselves by um, challenging all sorts of things that underlay our assumptions of about society. Um, and there's a view in the West that that historians and uh, and intellectuals and academics can be most useful when they're challenging things like that, challenging these kind of mythologies and assumptions that people had. But I, I don't. We're not at that stage yet in Georgia and in many places elsewhere. In Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, uh, where that's not something that is greeted uh, happily um, as a trait uh, of academics, and it's not something that most researchers, academics, 
strive for. And I think you have to combine that together with the more general problem of, of research, of academia, of universities in a place like Georgia. That, and I think that maybe there are some particular aspects of Georgia here in this, that um, the profession of being a scholar is uh, has has problematic aspects to it. And this goes back to the the really bad days of the 1990s, like when I first got here. That education, academia was one of the most corrupt fields, and yet one that was very much associated with prestige. But prestige that became a a a, a basis for that corruption. So buying degrees, buying spots in the university, um, buying uh, you know. <clears throat> it was really this sort of cesspit of corruption, which made um, those who were really most interested in scholarship understand that they had to either play that game and be involved with the corrupt aspects of uh, of universities or find another way to support themselves. And some of them just left or were forced out or ended up you know, selling stuff in the bazaar. Um, the the salaries for for professors at the time were laughably low, like twenty dollars a month, or you know, you, you simply couldn't live on that. So anybody with half a brain um, realized that you have to do something else in addition to being a professor, and usually that meant um, creating an NGO or working in the NGO world, or it meant going into government or going into university administration. So it created a system where uh, everybody was doing multiple things. It's sort of like the the uh, the Soviet anecdote about the the, the curse that may you live on your salary alone um, and when things changed and and began to to uh, improve uh, you know after the Rose revolution, they introduced the national ed- national entrance exam system, which really um, sort of undermined one of the the most basic elements of this corruption uh, they began to um, the universities themselves began to reform their structure, their faculties, their financing. Um, professors began to receive a much better salary. And compared with other fields of endeavor, the salaries are not bad. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're still laughably low by uh, European standards or North American standards. But you know, compared to other professions, they're not so bad. And one theoretically could live on a single salary. Um, but you still have this mentality and this uh, maybe this path dependency of, of this is what it means to be a scholar is to do multiple things. So almost everybody in academia and Georgian academia is, in addition to being a professor in a university or even uh, several universities, to the extent one can do that, given the you know the reform of the education laws, um, also doing something else, also running an NGO, also uh, being a member of parliament or having a government role or being in a think tank or being in the university administration. Uh, so those the, the problem here is that doing those other things always uh, are more urgent than research and teaching. And, and it, it's very uh, diverting you know, from the, uh, from the meat and bread and butter of actually doing research. And it also um, has the, in, the effect of affecting the way that young people perceive the career of being a scholar. Now, why should I do that profession if uh, I'm going to have to be doing multiple jobs? And they see their professors doing multiple jobs and not putting their focus on or all of their uh, attention on teaching and research. And so they have the same, the students themselves have that same sort of attitude. And for them, for for, be a graduate student, for example, is not a real job. Whereas in Western Europe or the United States, if you go to grad school, that you may, you might have to do work study or you might have to support yourself. You might have to do other jobs, but your primary job you, you would assume is is being a graduate student. Whereas here, that's that's never the case. It's a, uh, a very much a secondary thing. And for many people, uh, graduate education is uh, a is a hobby, and even even worse, it is a um, a vanity project. Um, this civil society sector, which basically came into fruition in a particular moment in the post in Georgia's post-Soviet development, how does that affect the way that popular memory about the Soviet Union is understood in Georgia, but also how does that affect how scholars inside the NGO sector or inside uh, the universities are engaging in some of these historical questions? Well, I, I think... First of all, there are NGOs that focus on history and on archives. Uh, 
There's only a few of them, a handful of them. Offhand, I could think mainly of two, of IDFI and, and SovLab. I think their emergence is in part tied into uh, the things that I've been talking about, the sort of distortion of the research and academic and university scene. Uh, on the one hand, these NGOs are primarily made up of younger scholars and younger people from more recent generations. Um, and I would also say that some of the most open-minded and uh, capable researchers in Georgia are working first and foremost in those institutions. Um, but they're also, for all the reasons I've discussed, they're not in the universities. And I, offhand, I think most of them are not teaching at all or don't teach students, or if they do, it's very much a sideline. And most of those people as well are also in this category of people for whom the actual, the formality of the degree uh, has become secondary for their work responsibilities in the NGOs. Um, and almost all of them have are at various stages of writing a dissertation, but haven't defended it. And you know, I said that that's that's fine because they're they're doing the job, and you know, they're doing research, and and a, a, a PhD degree is is a formality. Um, but I think it is something that uh, is unfortunate because it's it's like a union card, and it's a sort of um, a status sign that is understood outside of the country, regardless of what they're doing. But okay, that we leave that aside. Um, the fact that they end up in organizations uh, in this NGO sector in Georgia that emerges at this moment in the post-Soviet period when uh, NGOs become the lifeblood of a nascent middle class and a nascent civil society in the late Shevardnadze period and then leading into the Rose Revolution, um, I think that's relevant because it, it sort of shapes the, the, the background um, Georgia had a very rich civil society sector, and it was the only place where you could make your career in the late 1990s and early 2000s. You know, business really didn't exist. Government was completely corrupt. Universities were corrupt. And, and so young people went in that direction. It was where careers were made, where jobs were. Um, on the one hand, that's good. And I think it, it is something that underlies the, the Rose Revolution that happens later. It comes out of this sector of people working in that sphere who are inspired, I think, by the um, the model of NGOs by the the, the Western influences um, of things like cost accounting and rules and things like that that maybe maybe that might be better than the disastrous corruption that we see surrounding ourselves. On the other hand, it it had a distorting effect because even though it creates this vibrant civil society, it's a civil society that is driven first and foremost by donors and by uh, you know where the money is coming from and what are the requirements of the donors. So it created right. a a kind of system where people are going into that line of work because it is the only option and that's where careers are made. And so it becomes donor driven and right. it becomes very changeable. So, you know, this month we're going to do women's issues. Next week it will be children's issues. The next grant will be about voting rights and, right. and sort of moving from one thing to another. So I think it, it is an issue that like in other sectors of the NGO world, that topics tend to be determined by donors and donors are interested in, uh, in particular things and things that often in the case of history have the effect of, of doubling down on, on, on emphasizing those victimization elements, right? Of being interested in, um, in 1937 and interested in, uh, in the graves of victims, interested in um, repressed uh, uprisings uh, and, and those kind of things. It does shape research agendas. It shapes what uh, obviously where the salaries are of, of um, what projects people are going to be able to work on. I think though it does happen. There's two things I say about this. One is that in the NGO world, like in, in the Soviet period, like in any uh, attempt to apply structure to people and um, the people end up themselves with agency to shape those agendas themselves. So I think it's not entirely uh, donor generated that, um, the, the the local scholars themselves do have an ability, either directly or indirectly, to shape what the grant is going to be about, what the projects are going to be about, and even influencing what the donors uh, come to think is important. So it, it's not entirely one uh, in which the local researchers lack agency. And I think this overall um, narratives of history that exist in society and that exist in the universities that we've talked about, again, this very, this victim slash resistor uh, framework. Uh, 
I think another aspect of that that I haven't talked about, but I think it's very strong, is um, the top-down view of Soviet history and the desire to see it through the lens of um, what ev of everything coming from Moscow and, and and negation of local agency. That everything was commanded from Moscow, and that you know even if there were horrible people here like Berio or some of the perpetrators of the terror, that ultimately policy everything it's a, it's a very uh, what would be viewed in the west as a totalitarian model right that the soviet leadership is a monolith and a monolith in moscow uh, that shapes how everything happens on the local level and that there's no agency and and by uh, extension no no real accountability so one of the goals of the project of reimagining soviet georgia is to expand the understanding of the soviet period and the ussr in general Right, so that the nuance and the complexities of it can be taken into consideration. When I see particular organizations like, you know, Sovlab, for example, it seems that they have a very narrow focus on things like repression and gulags. Mm -hmm. And so then you get a situation where it seems like there's a lot of Western money and a lot of funding that comes in, and then it narrows the focus of how the history is presented and understood. So you have these people who make careers, who are professional historians in the NGO sector, who but but the way in which they're doing history is being informed, kind of like you mentioned, um, by these Western funds. And also, is there pressure on people who might otherwise be interested in examining more complex, nuanced dimensions of the Soviet society that are then funneled into, pushed into, or forced into conceptualizing things in a more you know narrow way. For example, I remember going to the, I think it was the party archive and being told that you know one of their main functions is being a place where people can go to get the reimbursements, those who were repressed under Stalinism. And, and, and even if that's well and fine, it's this where the, the archive itself now serves this function that is in line with maybe the narrow, the narrowizing, as opposed to being a place where um, more about the USSR, more about Georgian Soviet uh, experience can be understood. Yeah, and that was where I was ultimately headed with this whole discussion of this kind of distortion of the NGO sector by the, the needs of the donor. Um, and I think that also happens with these NGOs. I mean, there has been a kind of change, I think, from uh, from the late 90s and the early 2000s in that other career options have become possible that um, there, I think, is much more of a tendency of people wanting to go into NGOs uh, because they're interested in the topic that the NGOs work in. And, and these historical NGOs are, are an example of that, right? The people who are in these NGOs who do this, uh, who work on these topics are, are, are not switching back and forth between different things, depending on where grants are specifically and are actually interested in their topic. That said, though, the drive of the donor is still really important. These are NGOs that need to get grants and need to be able to pay the salaries of the people who are working on them. And the majority of the funding comes uh, from Western institutions, from Baltic countries, from other places, and it does tend to focus on those topics of repression and resistance. Um, and it, it does shape their research agenda. And it, I wouldn't say it puts a pressure in the sense that they are forced to fit into, you know, forced to write everything in, in these narrow confines. Um, but it, it gives them a kind of priority. Whereas I think there are people who work in those organizations who would be interested in researching more broad topics, you know, uh, you know, the history of everyday life or uh, the even controversial topics like you know, corruption in the Orthodox Church, or the um, the degree of of, of um, or the extent of, of collaboration, for example, or you know, reporting on on neighbors and things like that, um, but that are really driven by the necessity of doing these topics, which uh, which are dictated by by the by the grant and by um, by those sort of thing. It does tend to focus more on these these aspects of uh, of repression, of surveillance, of of victims, of victimization. There is a, a sort of grand narrative of history that of these periods that are shaped by things like geopolitics, um, you know, shaped by the relationship with Russia. Um, and again, this fact that the role of the researcher and the role of the academic is still not seen as, or is not one that should challenge the assumptions of society that that kind of thing isn't isn't rewarded. So I think those things play into into each other. And I think there are people, and I know people who work in these organizations uh, who are interested in topics that would challenge some of the the, the underlying assumptions 
uh, in Georgian society about conflicts, about especially about conflicts, for example, like the, the relationship with with Abkhaz and Ossetians, and you know, challenging some of the the underlying um, assumptions that people have about about that. It's not it's not something that's encouraged to be done by either the funders or by the sort of milieu of of how history is received in the public. One of the topics I know that you've written on is Abkhazia and a Soviet Abkhazia. So how has, in the sort of political context in Georgia, how has that personally been writing and researching on Abkhazia, especially Soviet Abkhazia? And have you received any pushback or have you received any um, resistance to, to some of those topics that you've explored in Georgia? Mm-hmm. Um I have not received very much pushback. Um, first of all, most of what I've published has been about the early Soviet period and mostly about the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, I did recently publish an article about the 1940s and the 1950s and about the, um, the ways in which the Soviet Georgian leadership under, under the leadership of Beria and, uh, the other Stalin's, um, client, Giladze, a period when there was very clear uh, oppression of the Abhas by ultimately by Georgians who were in control of those leadership networks. So things like, you know, changing place names, uh, eliminating the Abhas language from schooling, um, mass population movement of Georgians into Abkhazia. Um, those are things that are very unpopular. And I have seen other scholar, Georgian scholars get very angry about the suggestion that Abhas were repressed or Abkhaz were repressed by the Georgian leadership. Um, they have not come after me. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if that's because that article was more recent. Also, I think most of the, especially the more nationalistic and older generation um, who have these ideas about Abkhazia don't read stuff in English. So um, I, I don't publish those, and I haven't published those articles yet in Georgian, and I would probably receive more pushback if I had, were more public with arguments about about those kinds of things. Um, there is, uh, I, I have noticed among younger historians a more openness to thinking about the relationship of Georgians to Abkhazians that defies the, the popular conception. And there are two elements of the popular conception. One is one of the myths of Soviet history about Georgia, and that is specifically the so-called Ingarokva theory, this ethno-nationalist idea that um, the Georgians who occupy Rather, the Abkhaz who occupy Abkhazia today are not uh, historical Abkhaz. They are mountaineers who came down from the North Caucasus in the last two or three hundred years, and that the Abkhaz in the historical, the Abkhazians in the historical chronicles in the Middle Ages are actually Georgians. Uh, and so it's, it's a basically an argument about why the Abkhaz nation doesn't exist and doesn't have a right to that territory. And it's something that came up again and again. It came up particularly uh, in the 1950s, after the situation was reversed in Abkhazia, when after Beria and Stalin died, when the Georgians lost their kind of dominance in Abkhazia, and this was a reaction of the Georgian party and intelligentsia to support particularly that theory in different uh, guises, and it came up again and again, and it, it's challenged very much by certainly by Abkhaz historians who make the opposite argument about their own ethnogenesis, um, but also among some Georgian historians too, who, who would see this as as simplistic as you know uh not not ultimately supported by historical evidence um however the vast majority of people believe that if you go out on the street in tbilisi today and stop somebody and ask them who are the apas and where did they come from they say oh yeah they're mountaineers who came down from the mountains 200 years ago and it's a very much part of people's consciousness it was, it was repeated a lot uh in the, in the uh, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s during the, this ethno-national period and the other mythology is about um the concept of Abkhaz, and it ties into the first one, that they're not a real people, they don't really exist, they don't know that they don't exist. Um, if we just explain to them that they don't exist, then everything will be fine. And the other part of that is that they, they really are our, our younger brothers, and you know, they're our friends. They have been misled by their elites and specifically by Russia. And if we just explain to them that they're not a real people, to the extent that they exist at all, they're, they're just Georgians too. Uh, or if they're not, they should leave. And, and then everything will be peaceful. And they will explain to them that we're not their enemies, that Russia are. And, and it's only Russia that's provoking this. So this sort of uh, idea that they, they don't exist. They don't have a real basis for their, for their own grievance because all of those repressions and particularly the ones that happened during the Beria and Stalin time, those are not real. Those are imagined. 
uh, and they have no reason to dislike us or to fear us because they're really our younger brothers who are only misled about their own origins. Um, so those are the dominant narratives. And I do know that there are younger historians and some of them working in these organizations who uh, themselves are frustrated with that. Um, but it's not something that they are encouraged or maybe even might be somewhat fearful to, to be vocally ad, you know, uh, challenge those kind of myths. Because again, in Georgian uh, society, the scholar is not rewarded for challenging those kind of nationalist assumptions because again, national history is still perceived as uh, something that exists for the purpose of the nation, for the glorification of the nation, and for standing up for the geopolitical argument of the nation in its current situation. Is there a big difference between how historians from uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, or even other regions of Georgia talk about, frame, and research the Soviet past? I don't know enough about scholars in other parts of Georgia or if there are differences about that. I mean, there are. there's a very small but vocal Mingrelian, pro-Mingrelian group that challenges, you know, the... the um, assumptions about the existence of a Mongolian language and things like that, but I really don't know very much more beyond that. Um, I, I don't think there's very much of a South Ossetian historical community. Uh, there may be more in, in North Ossetia, but I'm also not really very familiar with that. Uh, I do know uh, the only thing I would know something about is is in Abkhazia, where um, history was part of the conflict. And you know they had their responses to this Ingarokva theory, their own arguments, their own obsessions during the late Soviet period about uh, the concept of ethnogenesis, uh, you know, using history, and ultimately this became a kind of mobilization of of history and a weaponization of history, and you know this continuing perception in Georgia all of those things that I was talking about, those assumptions uh, are, are the result of that, are the consequences of that. Uh, but they have a, a reaction in Abkhazia too, and their own um, historical arguments about ancient history, but also about more recent uh, history. And one of those things is something that, that uh, I'm sure I will be very much challenged on when my new book comes out about early Soviet Abkhazia. Uh, and that is the the mythology surrounding this early period, the 1920s and the 1930s, and the leader of Abkhazia, Nestor Lakoba, uh, and the mythology in the Abkhaz historiography and the Abkhaz um, perception, which is shaped by by historians and writers there, that you know this was a golden period, that this was a period of, of um, sort of an Arcadia, um, that Nestor Lakoba was almost a, a George Washington kind of figure that you know could tell no lie, that was deeply honest. Um, that um, went against the Soviet system, and there are mythologies in in about Lakoba that became part of this Abkhazian narrative, going back to the 1980s. That um, Lakoba was um, so pure and kind that he refused the offer of Stalin to take over the leadership of the secret police to replace Yezhov, and that this was the reason Stalin broke with him, and Stalin instead chose Beria to be at head of the Soviet secret police. Um, another myth is that Lakoba was able to stop collectivization from taking place and using his connection with, uh, with Stalin to cancel collectivization. Um, in my upcoming book, uh, based on massive amounts of archival documents, the picture of Lakoba that emerges is very different. It's just as fascinating. I mean, he's a really remarkable character who is super hyper-connected. He knew everybody uh, who was tremendously organizationally capable of balancing different networks off against each other. Um, yet many of these myths uh, simply are not supported. Um, that, you know, collectivization was was uh, delayed for, for a season, but then went really back to, uh, you know, and the, the extreme degree that it had been before, that really the collectivization was implemented, that there really were decollectization in Abkhazia. Um, I, I found this letter that Lakoba wrote to Stalin in 1936, in which he is very clear, I will do anything you ask me. No task is too small. Your wish is my, your desire is my command. And it seems to completely undermine this story that this myth that Lakoba uh, had been offered the job of Yezhov and had re refused it because he was such a, such a great person, such a kind and moral person. And, and more generally, the picture that, that Lakoba emerges from that is not the kindly George Washington to the extent that that myth is real, um, but really something completely different, really somebody who was absolutely ruthless, who was vindictive, um, 
who was in conflict with many of his ethnically Abha's uh, patrons and peers, that they themselves were in conflict with Akoba. So it very much, again, it undermines this, uh, this, this mythology uh, of the 1920s and 1930s of, of Abkhazia under Lakoba as this um, Arcadian peaceful place and Lakoba is beloved by all. And the reality is much more complex. So I'm sure uh, eventually when people get to read my book and if they read my book and, and if I translate it, then that I'm, I'm sure that will provoke a lot of outrage uh, within Abkhazia, not because necessarily they can show that that's not true, but simply because it challenges this the centrality of it's like, like a foreigner coming in saying, you know, writing a history of George Washington or Thomas Jefferson and um, pointing out the reality of that history. You can imagine how that would be received even in the United States, uh, but in Abkhazia, where I think like in Georgia, history also exists for the purpose of, uh, of national greatness uh, and for supporting the position of the nation in the geopolitical situation. Um, you can imagine how that would be received and will be. And they're already angry, I think, even though they haven't read it yet, just based on the blurb. So I know that you've written on the events of 1956 in Tbilisi, riots which took place against de-Stalinization and the 20th Party Congress secret speech. And I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about how these events shaped, changed Soviet Georgia. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about what this meant in terms of the position of the Georgian people or the Georgian nation, the Georgian Soviet Socialist Republic. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the other topic that I've, I've written quite a lot about. Um, I've written an article about this and ultimately published a, we published a, a book, a collection of, of, uh, of essays about 1956. Uh, and I really think that 1956 is kind of a watershed moment in, in modern Georgian history, but it's one that leads into controversial interpretations about that past and these are the ones that have gotten me into the most hot water um, locally, I think, and ones that are challenged uh, both by the younger and by the older generations of historians. Um, it seems to me that the, one of the particularities of Georgian history of the Soviet period that is impossible to ignore, no matter how much one might want to, is the reality that Stalin, a Georgian, was the Tsar of all the Russias. And that in the Stalin period and before the Stalin period, leading up to the Stalin period and leading up to Stalin's consolidation of power, you had a really very powerful patronage network based in the Caucasus and a great number of officials of, of high, highly important people in the Soviet leadership that came from Georgia and the Caucasus through this network. So how do you accommodate that? How do you deal with that? And I think it's something also that does not fit well into this prism of uh, of suffering and of resistance. You know, how do you deal with the fact that this Kafkaizki Khwast, this Caucasian network, was a central pillar of power in the early Soviet period, and then that Stalin and Beria, and not just those two people, but lots of officials from uh, of elites from the Caucasus and from Georgia came to power in the Soviet Union, were, were really ruling the Soviet Union. So it's an unusual situation, right? It's easy to be a subaltern and to be oppressed and to be the victim. But how do you maintain that victim narrative uh, in the face of the fact that your guys were running the country. And on the one hand, there is a, a desire to negate that, you know, to say Stalin, when Buivshi Gruzin, right? He's not even a Georgian anymore. Um, and to ignore all the others. And to the extent that you mention anybody, it's just Beria and, and, and Stalin. And those two guys were either not Georgians and were psychopaths and were an exception. Even people who want to do that, though, are really reluctant to abandon Stalin and to not take pride in Stalin. And it's one of those, it's a kind of paradox, I think, in, in Georgian history and one that exists up to today. Um, this, this, the irony that on the one hand, you want to negate the importance of Stalin. On the other hand, he was the local guy who became the Tsar of all the Russias. He, the most important, one of the most important people of the 20th century. How can you not take pride in that? So I think this does lead into what I have called this idea of, of, uh, Georgian national Stalinism or a, a Stalinist Georgian nationalism um, that underlie, that is there. And this brings up a question, which is one that's very controversial. How to understand the position of the Georgian Republic in the Soviet ethnic hierarchy uh, in the Stalin period? Were we the most repressed nation? Do we suffer more than anybody else? Or was Georgia privileged? 
And in what ways was Georgia privileged? And what does that mean to imply that Georgia had a privileged, sta privileged status in the Soviet period? And I think this is one of the reasons that the mythology about casualties in the Second World War it's a popular myth that, that people hold, and there are there are two versions of it. The, the the hard version of the myth is that Georgia suffered more casualties in the Second World War than any other republic by percentage of population. Um, that's clearly false, and there's a lot of statistics available about casualties uh, in the Soviet Union in, in the of the Soviet Union in the war. And the reality is is really almost the opposite. That uh, I mean, there was no fighting. There was very little fighting. There was fighting in the uh, in Abkhazia, you know, in 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 the North Caucasus. But very little, very little of the war took place on on Georgian soil, whereas other republics were practically flattened. You know, uh, if you look at Ukraine and Belarus, uh, so Georgia, by percentage of population, according to the most reliable statistics, are in second place behind Tajikistan. It was less. Um, the soft version of the myth is looking only at military casualties that Georgia lost more military casualties by percentage of population. And that's also difficult to calculate because you had a lot of official and unofficial military partisans and stuff. But the best statistics seem to show that Georgia is, is somewhere in the middle, but by far not the best, and in fact, behind the Russian Federation. Um, and again, if you look at the reality of, of how the war was fought, 26% you know, of the Belarusian population uh, <laughs> died in the Second World War. Sixteen percent of the of the of the Ukrainian population. The number for Georgia is around eight percent, and that's horrific. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about numbers between three hundred three hundred fifty thousand people, which is the total casualties of the United States in the Second World War for a tiny republic that was around three million people. So it's absolutely horrific. But it's not the worst. You know, it, it compared to these republics that were absolutely flattened, um, and and so why why do you want to make that argument? I mean, it has to be. We have to have suffered, and we have to have suffered more than anyone else. An another issue that comes up is um, looking at the Stalin lists, looking at percentage of people who were victims of, of 1937 and the terror. And Georgians uh, figure very, very highly in those, and even disproportionately highly. Um, the, the Georgian uh, intelligentsia was absolutely decimated. The, uh, the old party leadership was absolutely decimated. And uh, there's a, a tendency, a desire to make that part of the argument that how can you say Soviet Georgia was privileged in the Stalin period when we suffer disproportionately in, in the purges? And it seems to me that, I mean, yes, there, that, that's true. It's, it's hard to discount that, 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 that exists. I think a reason for that is not necessarily uh, hostility against the Georgian as an ethnic group within the Stalinist system, but Two things. One, the effectiveness of Beria and the, the Georgian network in implementing their tasks. And Beria did everything really well <laughs> and demonstratively well, including his numbers. And um, the other thing I think is that Georgia suffered so much exactly because it was so important, because this Caucasian network had been so important, because so many of the intellectual and party elites were, uh, were important figures that they became targets of the purges. And add to that the fact that Stalin was rewriting his own history and had to get rid of important people who knew about his past and knew about the reality of Koba before he became Stalin and you know, knew the reality of the revolution firsthand that he was trying to write. So uh, I, I think that, as much as anything else, explains those things explain, I think, um, why uh, the, the, uh, the casualties of, of the terror were so high in the Georgian Republic. And I don't think that undermines the fact that because Stalin was the Tsar of all the Russias and because George Stalin was Georgian, Georgia had a special status in that period. You can't make fun of Georgians when Stalin is a Georgian. And there were attempts by Stalin himself and by the regime to downplay his Georgian-ness. You know, if he's represented in films, you know, like Padinya Berlina, he speaks with a perfect you know, Russian accent without, without any hint of Georgian-ness. But, you know, they could never negate the fact that he was a Georgian. They were really trying to neg negate that, to recreate a different ethnic background for him. So he was Georgian. Uh, another issue that comes up is about how do you measure privilege status in the Soviet ethnic hierarchy? Uh, and one of the things that inevitably comes up is this question of how well did we live and did we get, did we get more resources? Did we get higher pay and things like that? Was our income higher? And this, I think, then becomes tied up in questions of um, of geopolitics. And it's, it's one of those things that relates to uh, the current debates between Russia and Georgia, right? That Russian nationalists will say, you live better under the Soviet period and you, uh, 
uh, you took advantage of that. You suckled at the teat of the Soviet system, and now you're you know, now you're saying you're rebelling. And Georgians want to push back on that and say we didn't have you know we didn't live better, and, and those things are just Russian propaganda. And they would perceive this whole argument that the status of the Georgian Republic in the Soviet period was uh, was high. Uh, as as part of that argument, and I think that's one of the reasons they want to negate that that argument so much. Um, it seems to me that you can actually show that if it, it's harder to show that individuals receive more privileges or more higher salaries or more more benefits, because you know consumer society was always in the Stalin period at the bottom. Um, you know, everybody, <laughs> nobody in the population at the population level did well um, in in the late Stalin period in terms of consumer products and light industry and things like that. What I think you can, where you, I think you can demonstrate the privilege status of Georgians in the Stalin period is if you look at opportunities for advancement and for promotion. Uh, and this is a, a measure that you can use to study the, the relationship of ethnic groups and other empires. Who could become a, an administrator outside of their own territory in the French empire or in the British empire? In the Soviet, in the Stalin period, Georgians had those opportunities. Georgians became the head of the Central Executive Committee and the deputy head of the Trade Ministry. Of the administ Georgian was the head of the uh, of the Commissariat for Heavy Industry under Orjan Nikidze, uh, the head of the NKVD in Belarus, the head of the NKVD in Uzbekistan. They were all Georgians. You know, some of these are, are barriers network, but. My point is that Georgians had promotion opportunities outside of the Georgian Republic in other territories of the Soviet Union. In other empires, that is a symbol of status, right? Um, no uh, Indian was going to become an administrator in, uh, in Uganda. They did become lawyers, and that's a reflection of their status. Um, no Zulu was going to be sent to India as an administrator, right? That just doesn't happen. Scotsmen were. Northern Irish were. And so I think that it's a, it, that, that's a kind of comparison that I would make, that the role of the Georgians in the Stalin period was more com comparable to the lowland Scots in, in the British Empire. You know, they were part of the project, and they, they had opportunities for promotion. Um, what I think happened, and this is the argument that I made in this article about March 1956, that it seemed to me that one of the reasons that people were so angry in Georgia at de-Stalinization was that the status of the Georgian Republic in the Stalin time was tied to the status of Stalin. And by attacking Stalin, by de-Stalinization, that implied a reduction in status of the Georgian Republic. And I argued that people saw that in terms of these promotions and opportunities, uh, that it meant real reduction, that you're no longer going to be able to be promoted up into the hierarchy. You're no longer going to be uh, appointed to, to, to officer ranks. They were reduced. They were, it was one of the symbols was officers, Georgian officers were expelled from the, from the Red Army. Uh, you're no longer going to get the same number of, uh, of university spots at MGAU and at, at Leningrad University uh, and these opportunities outside of the Republic. Um, and it, it seems very clear that the the base of the of those demonstrating in 1956 were young, ambitious people. Half of the people who were arrested on the night of March 9th were either party members or Komsomol members, and many of the others were high school kids. Um, exactly the kind of people who for whom opportunities would be important. So I think what they perceived consciously or unconsciously was a reduction of status in this ethnic hierarchy. That Georgia is going to be go from being higher up in the in, in the hierarchy and you know towards the top up there with Russia with Ukraine with the other um, most favored lord nations if you will and reduced in status to a colonial one like Tajikistan like Uzbekistan um, and that ties into this idea of, of a particular kind of nationalism that was tied to Stalin and tied to the position of Stalin and it, it's not a coincidence that. Maybe it's, you could even say it's a paradox that the Georgian national movement has its origins in 1956. Zviad Gamsa, Hurdi, and Mero and people of that generation. They were young. They were 15, 16, 17 years old, but they got their start. My professor, Dodana Kizire, who I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, was radicalized by this event, by desalinization, and then by the demonstrations, apparently after the 
uh, after those repressions, after those demonstrations were repressed on the night of March 9th, she came home, put her card, her party card on the table and tried to tear it up. And her mother desperately tried to stop her from ripping this up. So it is this paradox that Georgian national, uh, the Georgian nationalist movement, the Georgian national independence movement became radicalized exactly in defense of Stalin. Well, why in defense of Stalin? Because it, I think Stalin was tied to the, the status position of, of Georgia within this ethnic hierarchy. Ultimately, I think what happens is a kind of compromise that takes place after the March events, after those, those uh, demonstrations are, are repressed. Uh, Georgia's status changes. It does not become a colonial republic like Tajikistan. It doesn't go to the bottom of the ethnic hierarchy. But the relationship uh, becomes one that is much more like uh, that that the, uh, the Baltic republics had, in which it's basically a, a live and let live sort of thing. Do what you want in your republic, but keep it there. Don't aspire to leadership positions outside of your republic. Stay there. Uh, and it, it's sort of telling, I think, that you didn't have an, another Georgian in a really important position until Shevardnadze gets promoted to foreign minister in 1985, 30 years later. Um, but making this argument is something not Georgians are not enthusiastic about. What can be done to open up the study of the Soviet Union and Soviet Georgia's past in Georgia? Well, I think for, first and foremost, and I'm not sure if there's a... A, a strategy or tactics to make this happen, or if it, it's something that that will gradually happen um, with with more general changes. But the, changing this basic assumption of what history is for and the role of of the historian, and again this this sense that this continuity of the nineteenth century idea that history exists for the nation and for the glorification of the nation and for the support of the nation in its geopolitical stance. Um, and I think I mean one of the reasons it, it's clear why that emerges, and you know it's why that continues long past the 19th century in, in Georgia, because history was part of this national movement, um, that Georgia was part of defining its um, its status within the Soviet ethnic hierarchy and arguing for very real things. And again, in part, weaponizing that and using that as a as a means of, of, of conflict and for arguing um, for claims to territory and so forth. Um, and that continues in the post-Soviet Situation and it's one that's also shaped by by the geopolitical confrontation and then you know many of these arguments like about the one I was talking about about the status of the Georgian Republic in the Soviet period is tied in very much to the current Russia geo uh, Georgia geopolitical situation, but I think none of the other things will change unless that basic assumption about the role of history, the role of history historians, and the role of scholarship in general changes and becomes one where um, challenging mythology, challenging assumptions is something that uh, is not punished. And to the contrary, is some, it, when people begin to see that scholars, scholars are more useful and that scholarship is more interesting when it challenges those assumptions. And I don't see that happening yet. <laughs>